Δεύτερη ομιλία για απόψε. Είμαστε πολύ χαρούμενοι που έχουμε μαζί μας την καθηγήτρια Ελένη Παστέ από το Πανεπιστήμιο του Νέου Μεξικού, η οποία είναι και η διευθύντρια επιπλέον of the International Studies Institute του ίδιου Πανεπιστημίου. Ιδιαίτερη χαρά για δύο λόγους. Πρώτον, κατάγεται από τη Θεσσαλονίκη, το οποίο είναι πολύ... Μα ενδιαφέρει πάρα πολύ και μα <laughs> ευχαριστεί πάρα πολύ εδώ. Δε... Αν και είμαστε στην Αθήνα. Δεύτερον, ότι ξεκίνησε τι σπουδέ τη with the Bachelor of Arts in History από το Πανεπιστήμιο Bryn Mawr, College Bryn Mawr. Οπότε αυτό είναι μια από τα ιδιαιτερότητε τη Αμερική. Πολύ λίγο είναι γνωστό στην, στην Ελλάδα, αλλά αυτά τα μικρά liberal arts colleges που κάνουν εξαιρετική δουλειά. Και το Bryn Mawr έχει και δύο ιδιαιτερότητε κυρίω και τι οποίε έχει κάποια σχέση. Έχουμε κάποια σχέση. Είναι ότι πρώτον, είναι ένα καταφύγιο αρχαιοελληνικό. Ελληνιστών, γιατί έχει μία από τις καλύτερες πανεπιστημιακές βιβλιοθήκες για την, αρχαία, για την αρχαιότητα και την αρχαία Ελλάδα και εκδίδει και το Bryn Mawr Classical Review από τις πιο γνωστές εκδόσεις για την αρχαιότητα. Και το δεύτερο είναι ότι είναι επίσης και ένα άλλο καταφύγιο. Είναι καταφύγιο για τις άγριες χήνες του Καναδά κάθε χειμώνα που πηγαίνουν στο Bryn Mawr ακριβώς για να ξεφύγουν από τον χειμώνα του Καναδά και το οποίο καταλαβαίνω εγώ προσωπικά πάρα πολύ καλά. Η κυρία Καθήκη Κρία Μπαστέ έχει σπουδάσει, μετά έκανε το Master of Arts in Architectural History and her PhD at the University of California at Berkeley. Και είναι ιδιαίτερα γνωστή και ουσιαστικά από του λόγου τη σχέση τη με την Αθήνα είναι για την τακτορική τη διατριβή που εκδόθηκε μετέπειτα ω βιβλίο The Creation of Modern Athens, um, Planning the Myth, που εκδόθηκε από το Πανεπιστημιακό Ήδο του Κέμπριτζ το 2000 και πήρε το βραβείο John D. Κριτικό τη Modern Greek Studies Association. Έχει ασχοληθεί ιδιαίτερα με αυτό το θέμα. Έχει όμως και αυτή πάρα πολλούς άσους στο μανίκι της, αφού εκδίδει επίσης ποιήση και μικρές ιστορίες. Το short story στο λάθος, μεταφράζω λάθος μόνο μικρές ιστορίες, αλλά τέλος πάντων. Και θα ήθελα πλέον να πω και ένα τελευταίο ανέκδοτο, πριν τη ζητήσω να πάρει το λόγο, είναι ότι έχει γράψει ένα πολύ ενδιαφέρον άνθρωπο, ακόμα μια φορά, μικρή παρένθεση, ο Δημήτρη Πικιόνι και ο τι έκανε ο Δημήτρη Πικιόνι στην Αθήνα. Μπορείτε να πάτε να το δείτε στην έκθεσή μα στην Ακτιβού Σταθήνα του 2017, αλλά με τον Άγιο Δημήτριο τον Λουμπαρδιάρη. Αλλά έχει γράψει ένα ιδιαίτερα ενδιαφέρον άρθρο, συγκρίνοντα τον Δημήτρη Πικιόνι, τον Έλληνα αρχιτέκτονα, με τον Τούρκο αρχιτέκτονα Σεδάμ Ελντέμ, ο οποίο δεν είναι άλλο από τον θείο του πρώτου μα ομιλητή. Χωρί λοιπόν να καθυστερήσω άλλο, προφανώ την κυρία Μπαστέα να έρθει να λάβει το λόγο. Ευχαριστώ. Θέλω να ευχαριστήσω τους διοργανωτές αυτής της ημερίδας και επίσης όλους τους συναδέλφους και τις συναδέλφους που δώσανε έτσι ομιλίες σήμερα που συνέχεια κρατούσα σημειώσεις. Δυστυχώς δεν έχουμε χρόνο για να συζητήσουμε το, το βάθος των ομιλιών. Έτσι λίγο πιάσαμε μόνο τις, την επιφάνεια, αλλά φαντάζομαι θα ξαναβρεθούμε. Και ευχαριστώ πολύ για την εισήγηση, για την το introduction. Ε, σήμερα δεν θα πω για τη Θεσσαλονίκη, αλλά ίσως κάποτε στο μέλλον <laughs> να ξανασυναντηθούμε. Uh, and it is true that um, the, the first time I came across um, them was uh, when I was told by common friends who are architect, architects and architectural historians, oh yes, his uh, nephew teaches at Bosporus University, and then we met um, several times actually since then. Okay. So. Let's see. The 19th, you can hear him in the back, okay. It's good, all right. <laughs> the 19th century uh, French uh, critic Charles Baudelaire claimed that the modernization, code, the modernization of the city at once inspires and enforces the modernization of its citizens' souls, unquote. I wonder if this is true or even possible in Athens, in Paris, or anywhere. Here we're looking at Athens 1821 and um, Athens 1835. Um, and um, the Acropolis um, 
during the period um, you just heard about. Can the planning and building of Athens, a modern but minor capital city, bring about the modernization of its citizens' souls? And how can we study and describe that process? This is the central question that I will try to address today by reviewing the process of the modernization of Athens during the 19th century through the planning and architectural transformations and its mixed support by locals and foreigners. We will also gauge the effect of this process on its citizens' mentality, if not its souls, by the late 19th century. After its liberation from the Ottoman Empire, Greece had to build a coherent national culture. The construction of national identity was oriented internally towards its own citizens and externally primarily towards the Greek inhabited territories of the Ottoman Empire. Language, history, and religion were all examined anew, now seen as the foundations of a unifying state culture and ideology. State-controlled education, the army, and civic and religious ceremonies were all major agents of the nation-building project. Modern Greece began calibrating its progress on a new scale by measuring how far it had come from its immediate Ottoman past and how close it was to civilized Europe. Now, this audience knows that the Ottoman Empire was undergoing similar changes in the 19th century, but that was not mentioned in the Greek historical literature of the 19th century. Just as the Greeks did not want any more um, Turkish-like villages, I know from Zeynep Celik's work and others that um, the same thing in Istanbul, they wanted the modern European influences. That's again another uh, collaborative talk, perhaps. During the 19th century, the country pursued the following many asp asp main aspirations. Number one, acceptance in the family of modern European nations. Number two, internal cultural and political unity and gradual territorial expansion. And number three, a strong connection, if not identification, with the classical past. Here we see the ancient sculpture and the 19th century sculpture to the right. How were these national aims reflected on the design of the urban fabric? We're seeing the, um, the plan of Fauvel, was mentioned earlier as well as, as one depiction of Athens in the 1800s, and then the proposal for the new plan of Athens by Cleanthes and Schaubert, 1833. What was the process that transformed Athens from an Ottoman village into the smart capital of the fledgling Greek nation, and what was the political and cultural significance of this transformation? New design for the capital um, by the architects, um, Cleanthes and Schauber that we saw earlier was um, a little bit changed by Leo von Klenzer, but primarily it stayed in this, along the same lines. The 1832 provisional Greek government commissioned Cleanthes and Schauber, two young German trained architects, to design the plan for New Athens. Although the city was not yet the capital of Greece, it was widely assumed that it would become the capital. Cleanthes and Schaubert were asked by the provisional government to design, quote, a new plan equal with the ancient fame and glory of the city and worthy of the century in which we live, unquote. The architects submitted their design and explanatory memorandum in December 30, 1832. A month later, King Otto and his regents were established in Nafplio, which was the Greek capital at the time. And Otto's government approved the Glanthi Schaubert Plan in 1833 with the same decree that announced the transfer of the capital from Nafplion to Athens. And this is what the development of the city actually looked like by the 1870s. The new plan with its straight white streets, new civic structures, and elegant boulevards symbolized the country's rebirth and reconstruction. New Athens was designed for a population of 35,000 to 40,000. Although the old city was perched on the Acropolis Hill, the proposed extension covered a relatively flat terrain. The plan followed, as you can see, a symmetrical pattern accommodated 
um, accommodating the layout of the existing city and paying homage to the antiquities and um, proposing an extension along um, the northern and eastern parts of the city. Now, we also can see from um, drawings in the uh, General State Archives how the streets themselves were uh, straightened, were widened, and so on. Uh, and um, this particular plan is from the, uh, was in the um, Ministry of Planning. But again, you can see the, the gradual and painful process that transforms, even to the small scale that was uh, transformed, the original, um, let's call it organic plan of the city to a more um, geometrically clear plan that we see. And all along, actually, these changes, there were numerous petitions by the residents asking for var variance or asking for permission to build and so on, written either by themselves or most likely through uh, scribes, showing uh, just a, a small connection with the immediate Ottoman past, showing a certain familiarity with the process of going and asking for variations, asking permission to change the plan and so on, and pleading their case, oh, I'm a widow and I have a small kids and I need to build here and so on. So the process was not um, um, like uh, uh, totally from top down. There was a lot of give and take, and a, lo a lot of give and take. Uh, as I say, all of that you can see in the um, files and the archives uh, of Otto, Otto's period and uh, King George's period. Um, let's see. And here we see the, this, a view of the city of Athens from Lycabitus from 1870. Now, how did the Athenians uh, themselves in the 19th century discuss their city? Let's start with the major civic structures. The royal palace, um, designed by Friedrich von Gainter and completed in 1843, was the first major building constructed in Athens. Despite its uninspired and pared down design, I mean, the, historic, the architectural historian me would say it's very boring. The architect himself said it was very boring because they took away all the decorations he had to save money. So the architect himself said it looked like the barracks. But the point that um, I tried to describe in my book was that it didn't really matter to the people in Athens what exactly it looked like from our art historical eyes. Uh, for them, it was the symbolism that was very important. As uh, the historian uh, of the 19th century, Bulgaris, noted in 1862, the palace endowed Athens with a certain character of permanence. So it was the symbolism and not so much the particular design uh, and application. The university was completed in 1864, and this was designed by the da Danish architect Christian Hansen. It did not address the most pressing educational problems of the time, like, namely the lack of elementary schools. Rather, it helped mark Athens as the cultural center of Greece, increasing its stature in the Balkans. That's how uh, some of the contemporaries saw it. And I'm quoting here a Greek historian writing in 1896, quote, the establishment of the university was one of the most important events in the history of modern Athens. Thus we revived the ancient times when those who desired higher education came from all over to the country of Plato and Aristotle. Serbians, Bulgarians, Romanians began to come to Athens and to take the literature, science, and culture of Athens back to their own countries." Unquote. Similarly, the building of the academy, which started in 1859, not to be completed until nine, nine, uh, 1900, actually, carried um, a powerful symbolism. The construction of the academy and the national library Okay, so here we have the front, of course. Both uh, the library and the academy designed by Theophil Hansen, um, um, uh, Christian's brother. Uh, further established University Avenue, Panepistimiu, uh, as the cultural axis of the new capital. Underscoring the ac academy's symbolic significance, the Athenian city council agreed in 1859 that, quote, 
the academy to be erected on Panepistimiu Square will become an agent of the greatest ethical and material value for the municipality and the nation, contributing furthermore to the beautification of the city." Unquote. So here again, the symbolism and the connection with um, antiquity. Uh, similar arguments supported the erection of the National Library, which completed the Athenian trilogy. University Avenue, which terminated at the elegant tree-planted uh, Syntagma Square, that fronted the palace, literally and symbolically etched the line connecting official cultural production and the king's residence. The royal palace and the buildings of the Athenian trilogy contributed to the first national aspiration I mentioned earlier, the incorporation of Greece into modern Europe, at least culturally. Becoming part of Europe was not only a cultural but also a political project for the Greeks themselves. Institutions such as the library and the university did not address directly the, the country's practical needs, but rather they addressed its projected image as the cultural beacon of the, ba of, uh, of the Balkans and the Middle East. And as King George I said when he came to the throne, Greeks, the aim of my ambition is this, to make Greece, as far as that is dependent on me, a model kingdom in the East." Unquote. The, Greeks second st uh, the Greek state's second aspiration, internal cultural and political unity, found expression in the construction of the new cathedral on Metropolis, on Cathedral Street, next to the modest 12th, cent 12th century church of uh, Panagia Gergiopikos, which had served the Athenian people during the Ottoman period. The widespread demand for a new cathedral, which was completed, the cathedral was completed in 1862, reflected the country's continued attachment to the Orthodox religion that united the majority of the population during the Ottoman period. The architecture of most new civic and government buildings, and here we're looking at the Polytechnic by Lysandros Kaftanjoglu, um, adhere to neoclassicism, realizing the country's third aspiration, strong connection, if not identification, with the classical past. Since Europe claimed its roots in ancient Greece, and since modern Greece oriented its policy toward Europe, the adoption of neoclassicism was doubly justified. It strengthened ties to the classical tradition and demonstrated the country's Western orientation. Several projects helped strengthen the connection between modern Greece and antiquity. These included the restoration of the Acropolis that was mentioned today, including removal of all post-Roman structures, the design of most civic and government buildings in the neoclassical style, and the adoption of the, in general, the German educational model, which favored a classical curriculum. Throughout uh, and here we see that um, for the upper class Greeks, by the late 19th century, visiting the antiquities became an educational undertaking. Here they're all um, dressed and ready to go on an excursion to learn about their past. There's a certain distance that has been created then between the antiquities and your everyday life. Throughout the 19th century, planning and civic architecture succeeded in making the government visible to the people. At a time when the concepts of government, kingdom, and parliament were novel and continuously redefined, architecture helped anchor them spatially and physically. Here we're looking at the new parliament building by Boulanger and Kalkos. This new civic architecture allowed the Athenian public to begin forming a concrete image of its governing institutions. But as Athenians um, also saw many of the government offices housed in rented buildings, they realized the discrepancy between the grand abstract ideas of Western politics and the messiness and poverty also of everyday governance. 
For instance, here we're looking at the buildings, they look nice, finished, the roads are unfinished. This isn't only happening in Athens by any means. I mean, we can find pictures of Paris at the same time that have the same discrepancies, and that's part of the duality of modernity, I would argue, and others have argued as well. Citizens remained engaged with the building process as town planning came to signify national progress. They believed that if the government was unable to implement the plan of Athens, then it must be unable to govern the country, period. Uh, some structures went up without permits, often on archaeological sites, they still do, often on future parks, and so on. Nevertheless, it is interesting to see the pride of some of the officials uh, excuse me, like a letter by um, Emmanuel Manitaki, who was an engineer in charge of public works in Greece, who wrote in 1866, I quote, Greece, when she came out of the War of Independence, was literally a pile of ruins. After the liberation and within a third of a century, 23 old, 23 old cities were rebuilt and 10 new ones were founded. Unquote. He was especially proud of Athens with its, quote, large and well-aligned streets, beautiful houses built according to Italian taste, the oldest of which date only to 1834, and numerous public structures. And it, he was also proud of its population, which in the manner of dressing, living, and thinking, says Manitaki, is so well identified with the great family of the civilized nations of Europe, unquote, 1866. Now, what did um, travelers say? Of course, we always have to see what their opinion is. So, uh, Charles Tuckerman, the US ambassador to Greece between six, 1867 and 1874, remarked that in Athens, a few of the shop windows, quote, be it the jeweler, tailor, or silk mercer, almost rival those of the Palais Royal, unquote. And in um, 1887, Charles de Moy uh, commented that, quote, Stadium Street is the most beautiful in the city. Um, here we have Athena's view. Uh, let's go to mm, one more. Okay, Stadium Street. Um, the most beautiful in the city, the Boulevard, the Boulevard des Italiens and the Saint Elysees of Athens. From three to five o'clock in the winter and from five to eight in the summer, he continued, all Athenians promenade on the great paved sidewalks of this large thoroughfare, unquote. So that was written in 1887. Now, perceptive Athenian intellectuals, and these are people who also traveled, like everyone here, um, also pointed out that although the buildings in Athens rivaled those in other European cities, their content was often disappointing. They complained that the meals at the Greek restaurants could not rival those in Paris or London. The imposing buildings of the National Library did not reflect a similarly high level of education in Athens since the city needed more elementary schools. And while they said the shops looked like the ones abroad, their offerings were often disappointed. So this um, discrepancy between facade and content um, uh, persists, I think, on many levels of, uh, of life in Athens then, but I'm not claiming it's only unique to Athens. I think change uh, bears that out. By 1900, Athens boasted several paved straight wide streets. Some, uh, some were tree planted, um, there were lights at night, and they even sprinkled water on the streets on very hot summer days. Now, photographs some um, and paintings also depict a fashionable society that frequented cafes, attended literary salons, and strolled along the newly lit uh, boulevards on straight and paved sidewalks. Now, did the modernization then of the city fabric bring about the modernization of the residents' mentality? Um, let, let's look at a specific example. In 1884, the municipal council in Athens gave names to 250 roads. They, they named the streets. Uh, when the French traveler Elie Carbon visited 
Five years later, in 1989, he noted, I quote, the coachmen cannot read. They're unable to decipher the names of the streets and the numbers of the houses. On the other hand, they have memory and know the city admirably and almost all of the names of the inhabitants, unquote. And this is a pattern that we see ongoing, um, locating yourself in place by, uh, here is the, the, the store that sells milk and across the street is so and so and so and so. Um, that way of knowing space is overlapping with the more Cartesian uh, way of um, coding space that comes with naming avenues and streets and n numbering the buildings. So it's again the duality, let's say, of modernity and pre-modernity overlapping. And we also see that um, in the photographs, as we see here, family members, some are dressed in their traditional clothes when they get ready to go have their photograph taken, which is a big event, while others uh, show off their European preferences. The traveler Gaston Deschamps observed in 1892, I quote, in an apparently contradictory disposition, the Greek wants to adapt to the European customs while guarding also simultaneously the, original, the originality peculiar to his race. His pride urges him to imitate the Western manners and mode. At the same time, however, he preserves an old fund of tenderness for the local traditions from which he would part with difficulty. Among the cultivated Greeks, this sort of duality is striking, unquote, uh, dualité grecque. So we can meet the modern man um, uh, along the way, and we can also see them celebrating technological um, breakthroughs, like the introduction of the train, um, or the other modernization projects that were carried out by Harry Lostrikoupis, the minister, the modernizing Minister Harry Lostrikoupis, including the opening of the Corinth Canal in 1882 that was um, recorded both in paintings and also in photographs. Now, what's this telling us? It's telling us that um, they are beginning to be more interested in technology and moving away from archaeology, more or less, or um, the connect the sort of identification with the classical past. Um, we have very beautiful facades, but at the same time, the country is um, at the brink of bankruptcy, and um, Tricoup is uh, famous pronounced in 1893, unfortunately, we are bankrupt. Uh, once again, the, the surface looking very fancy, the content, um, quite problematic. Um, but the, again, the modern and the Ottoman um, persist, and we can see them um, throughout the um, depictions of culture in the 19th century. Uh, in terms of technological progress, the creation of new factories like the um, weaving, uh, thread and weaving factory here uh, shows progress, of course, and um, the uh, new emphasis on the education of women, including women who are um, uh, in, um, who are exercising, who are doing uh, athletics, um, it shows forward um, promise. Um, I, I, very briefly, I want to contrast the reviving of the Olympic Games on the one hand with another development in Athens uh, at the same time. For the Olympic Games, which is um, a familiar um, story here, especially since we had the, the Games again in 2004, the importance of it, the first modern Olympics is uh, well known. That included, of course, the restoration and the pride of um, the nation. Um, for a brief two weeks, the gods had granted the Greeks their three wishes, to be accepted as the legitimate heir to ancient Greece, to become part of the civilized nation of Europe, nations of Europe, and to forge their own distinct identity. Not only did foreigners come to 
watch the Olympic, Olympics, but Greeks got to watch foreigners. Um, I believe that they tended to feel like they were in a fishbowl for the most time. What are foreigners saying about us? That was a very common refrain in the press. Uh, by hosting the Olympics, they actually had the opportunity to watch uh, out. It's very interesting that um, when they bought tickets to go and watch the games, very quickly they um, found their seats and the terms that were used at the time uh, on the um, um, stadium were um, ancient words like skelos, the right or left side of the skelos, the spendony, and so on, uh, very specific words, but it seemed like quite quickly the population, uh, which the tickets were very affordable, was able to feel at home in this new, um, in this new site. Uh, this is what I call the multilingualism, if you will, of space. That you know your city as it always was. You're beginning to know it with its new streets and even street names. And you also figure out how to find your seat in this, um, in this new um, site, the site of the remodeled stadium. The, what I would like to um, point out here is um, when the Greek uh, audience was awed and shocked and excited by the victory of the Greek Spiros Louis in the Olympics, one of the journalists who recorded that um, wrote the following. Spiros Louis won, and the people, at, this is quote, Spiros Louis won, and the people admired and worshiped his victory and attributed it to divine power. He was taken, say the people, and so it will be remembered from now on as a popular tradition. He was taken, says the tradition, by St. George, and that is why he did not get tired, and that is why he completed the race of the marathon so quickly." Unquote. So to me, this is the religious beliefs of the Byzantine and the Ottoman periods continuing to hold power, if not increase in power, perhaps as a form of resistance to the forces of, um, of westernization. At the same time that we have this um, um, apex of uh, classicism in Athens, it's also interesting that we see the, um, here we see Louis with the other athletes, we see at the same time, that's the end of the 19th century, uh, what um, historians have called the invasion of Karagiozis, the shadow puppet theater of Ottoman roots in Athens. Karagiozis' performances had all but disappeared in Athens after 1864, and they slowly started appearing again after 1892. So there was a performance in the Anafiotica neighborhood, and then there was another one at the Café de Xameni, which at the time was considered isolated. And by 1901, though, the, the Xameni became the Café of Intellectuals, and 200 seats were set up to watch Karagiozis, Karagiozis shows. Um, in 1893, they did not list them in the newspaper. A year later, they started doing that. And uh, to the point where there was even um, uh, resistance, like, oh, all this foul language, and so on. By the end of the 19th century, the previous itinerant Karagiozis performances were anchored in specific locations in Athens. Now, the audience had, itself had changed. Originally, um, it was uh, soldiers, bullies, patrons of ill reputed dance, and so on. But gradually, we have also journalists, intellectuals, politicians, and so on, going to watch um, Karagiozis. I'm closing with this uh, reference to Karagiozis because I consider it an interesting aspect of the modernization of the city. Modernity is reverse side, if you will. It's opposite, but also it's double. I believe that the Karagiozis performances define the new Athens as much as the impressive buildings on Panepistimiu, the Athenian trilogy, and so on, as much as the Olympic Games did. They're all an integral part of the modern experience. 
It's not remarkable that a popular culture entertainment should develop and thrive in Athens alongside its highbrow counterparts. What I would like to underscore, however, is that by the end of the 19th century, an unprecedented dynamic cultural exchange was taking place among the different strata of society. The growing interest of the Greek literati in Karagiozis' performances coincided with their more general interest in the culture of the East as they understood it, as they perhaps recreated it, as the, the culture that they considered to be of the simple, unlettered people. So this is the time that we have um, music groups from Smyrna and Constantinople invited to perform, perform in Athens, while Western-trained artists depicted scenes of village life in their paintings. Although these exchanges did not erase social differences, of course, or respective cultural preferences, they did engender a creative interactive flow that marked the city's culture. I see a connection between the way common people learn to orient themselves in the unfamiliar spaces of the new stadium with its fendoni and tears, and the way intellectuals track down the out-of-the-way Karagiozis performances. The success of the city's new civic architecture with its straight boulevards, the success of the first modern Olympics, and so on, made Athenians proud of the progress and development they had accomplished since the country's independence. It allowed them to show to the Europeans and to themselves that they were legitimate heirs to the classical past and citizens of the modern industrialized world. Once this was established, however, Athenians became more ready to acknowledge also their eastern roots, which were never too far from the surface in the new capital or anywhere else. In discovering the spaces of the new city, ancient, Byzantine, Ottoman, and modern, high and low culture, they were discovering their multiple identities in the country, in the city, and in themselves. Thank you.